<laughs> so we 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 are at we are at three o'clock. Um, so uh, welcome to everyone that's joining us on our uh, first Sandhouse Group uh, event of this academic year. Uh, I'm Brett Johnson. I'm the senior associate director of the Transportation Center. Um, you know, we'd much rather be uh, meeting with a number of you in person at the lower level of Chambers Hall. Um, but unfortunately, our current circumstances uh, require us to see you all today by Zoom. Um, however, we've got a really great attendance, so I think that shows that uh, Zoom really is going to work out really well. Um, I also have with me from the Transportation Center, uh, Joan Pinnell, who's our uh, Assistant Director of Communications and who helped uh, get out this invitation to everybody. And I believe she has, if she hasn't yet, she'll be posting our next event uh, sometime after this meeting. But uh, in the interest of time, you know, I would like to turn the floor over to uh, Norm Carlson, who has been leading our uh, Sandhouse group for many, many years. And uh, so Norm, it's all, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Brett. I understand we have somewhere around 100 people attending today, so that is a really good crowd for a Sandhouse meeting. You all can read Bill's uh, CV and the announcement, but what I think it is important for all of us to know is that Bill is extremely knowledgeable on railroads in the United States and Canada, and and great knowledge beyond the borders of those two countries. Bill clearly understands the distinction between news reporting and editorials. He is very fair in his reporting and he knows the facts in his editorials and his opinions are worth listening to. In this COVID period, Bill has reached out with very in informative podcasts with a diverse group of topics and particularly a diverse group of people and Northwestern, at the same time, through the Transportation Center, has been reaching out with a whole series of Zoom broadcasts, and that kind of gave us the idea between Brett and myself that we should try a virtual format for the Sandhouse group. It was obvious that Bill should be the first presenter in this new format, and with that, I want to thank him for having a Metro locomotive on the opening slide of his presentation, and Bill, the floor is yours. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Norm. I'm uh, uh, very glad to, uh, to do this. Uh, you know, uh, Norm and I have known each other for, for a long time. Uh, I've, I've been with the publication for tw uh, just over 28 years. And uh, uh, I have to say, uh, you know, uh, Chicago is, uh, is, is one of my uh, favorite cities. When, when I joined the publication in 1992, I spent my first week uh, uh, in the Chicago office. Uh, uh, working with uh, a couple of uh, editors, uh, one of whom is uh, long, past, long since died, uh, uh, Gus Welty. At uh, you know, he was our senior editor. But uh, yeah, we you know we uh, uh, we get together uh, every year, of course, uh, at the Union League Club for the, the Railroader of the Year. I hope we can do that this March. Uh, we hope hope things that will will be better, uh, God willing. So. Uh, Thanks for uh, thanks so much for inviting me. So, okay, so I am going to uh, share my screen, and um, all right, this should work. Ah, okay. Um, I think I need to go to a. Uh, let's see. I need to. I think I need to go to a full screen view if I am. Okay. How how are we how are we looking here? You can push the uh, Bill. You can push the play button in the upper right hand corner of your PowerPoint screen. Ah, the play button. Yes. Yes. There we go. Okay. Ah, here we go. Okay. All right. Okay. So that looks good. Okay. All right. Great. So we've been covering uh, since the beginning of the pandemic uh, what's been going on in, in the industry and. Uh, uh, it's been it's been nonstop. Um, the the uh, the pandemic has actually forced us to to think about new and different ways that we can that we can cover the industry. Um, 
And uh, so we, we launched uh, with, with the help of Bill Wilson, who is our uh, editor uh, based in Chicago of Railway Track and Structures. We launched our Rail Group on Air podcast series. Um, we've gone virtual with several of our uh, conferences. We did our uh, Rail Group, uh, rather, um, Rail Insights Conference, we normally held it uh, in Chicago. We did that virtually. We did a light rail conference virtually. And we have another uh, rail group, uh, rather, uh, Rail Insights Conference. It's just too many rails here. I'm getting confused. <laughs> uh, a Rail uh, Insights Canada Conference, which is going to be uh, on the 27th. So hope you tune in for that. So I've been asked to, uh, to deliver a presentation here. and. Um, um, so I want to talk about uh, the p pandemic and the post-pandemic. Uh, what could and this and this is a this is a phrase is probably you know it's become a buzzword now. New normal. Well, what is the new normal? What is what is it going to look like? Um, I'm going to cover freight and passenger. So on the left, uh, you see a BNSF uh, stack train going through the. Uh, uh, sunken uh, roadbed on the Alameda corridor coming out of the port of uh, Los Angeles and Long Beach. And uh, on the right, uh, there is a very, very pretty blue, red and white locomotive. It belongs to a transit agency called Metra commuter rail system. Uh, one of the finest in the nation. There's uh, 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 hauling some gallery cars. So, uh, you know, I'm from New Jersey. Uh, our, our headquarters are in New York. I was been a New Jersey transit customer for uh, for many years, but I said, no, I think I think I should use a Metra image. So here we go. There's there's Metra, and that is an F40, and it's not one of those Winnebago's we were Norm and I were talking about earlier. That's a uh, that's got a full uh, uh, full nose on there. Okay, so I'm going to use my arrows. Okay, so uh, we all know that the pandemic has created huge changes. Uh, uh, not only in our industry, but in society, transportation has been impacted at all levels, freight and level, freight and passenger, not just, of course, in North America, but all over the world. Um, I don't think there's a, there's a rail system, freight or passenger that hasn't been impacted by, by COVID-19. So, um, okay, I don't, I don't want that little window popping down, okay. But needless to say, uh, as railroads always do, uh, this, the industry has, has responded um, because what we do is provide very vital services, whether, whether it's moving goods or moving people and dealing with the change. So now I think what, what, what everyone is, taught, is thinking about and is acting upon, well, what does our future look like? Uh, because th things are things are going to change. There are certain things that will remain the same, but a lot of things are going to change. And and uh, so, what are the opportunities? What are the challenges? And and the thing to keep in mind is that the industry has been undergoing a, a transformation now. For well, you could really go back to the Staggers Act, which which is forty year, which was passed forty years, the Staggers Rail Act, which partially deregulated the railroads. You could go back that far to nineteen eighty where the industry has been in, trans, in transition, but we've seen a, uh, uh, some very significant developments in the past five to 10 years uh, that were underway uh, when this pandemic hit. And I think because of the pandemic, they've been accelerated. So uh, let's take a look at um, what freight has been doing, freight traffic has been doing. Uh, the numbers are starting to come back up. Uh, if you, and these are, these are all the latest figures from the Association of American Railroads, the rail time indicators uh, for the month of September. And, and uh, the charts actually track back uh, uh, quite a bit. Um, <clears throat> if, you look, uh, if you look at the, at the whole year, uh, you know, 2019, uh, the red line, this is the chart in the U.S. rail intermodal units, okay? Uh, if you look at the chart uh, in the upper left-hand corner, the intermodal units, uh, you know, 2018 was, uh, was, a, was a good year, except toward the end of the year, we started to see a dip in traffic. 
same same thing happened in 2019, but although the levels levels were off, so that you know the economy was was starting to show some signs of uh, signs of weakness. Now, as you expect, take a look at 2020. Okay, we're on intermodal, which is uh, trailers and containers. Uh, look at that uh, that huge dip. Uh, you know, the, there there you've got a. You've got if you go back to like week five or five or six, which is about when the uh, when the pandemic hit, uh, all of a sudden, wham! You know, it it it's traffic started fall. It fell off a cliff almost, uh, and slid down very rapidly up to about uh, week eighteen, uh, going into a U-shaped curve, and and here it is, uh, coming back up. And if you take a look, it is now just uh we're we're through 39 weeks or 39 or 40 weeks and you see the traffic is back to uh the peak year of 2018. so the numbers for intermodal now uh 1.31 million containers and trailers uh in the month of september that's up 7.1 percent over the prior year prior year and month that is the biggest year over year percentage gain for intermodal since December 2016. Uh, the average weekly volume in September was uh, at 200, almost 285,000 units. That is the fourth highest or the fourth most for any, any month in history. Uh, largest quarterly gain in, in the third quarter since, uh, since uh, the fourth quarter of 2018. Now, why the change AAR? Well, they did some analysis. So the imports of consumer goods are surging. Uh, uh, merchandise coming in from, from the Pacific Rim, made from China, uh, it's back. So China's export machine has come roaring back. Um, but take a look at the new, what the New York Times had to say. Uh, and I, I don't know, I, fi I, find this, I find this a little, disturbing, I guess, and maybe I shouldn't, but I'm not editorializing here too much. <laughs> China has grabbed a much larger share of global markets this summer from other manufacturing nations. The pandemic has also found China better placed than other exporting nations. It is making what the world's hospitals and housebound families need, that's you and me, uh, housebound families need right now, personal protection gear, home improvement products, and lots of consumer electronics. Okay, um, you know, uh, I'll, uh, I'll leave the uh, conspiracy theorists to, uh, to, to their conspiracies. I uh, won't comment on that, but uh, it is what it is. Now, going to carloads. Um, carloads are starting to come back up, but, but, but as you can see, uh, 2020, they're, they're still, they're, they're trailing behind, uh, pretty far behind intermodal. Uh, so we're still seeing negative numbers in um in carload freight and uh so the 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 losses in carload freight are uh, are are they're, they're being offset by the by the losses in by the gains in intermodal i should say the gains um uh but not completely um so i think it you know clearly i think those are indicators of uh of, of where where the business is and and, and it is and and uh uh, and intermodal. So just take a quick look at the chart on the left, or rather on the right, um, uh, comparing total U.S. rail car loads and inter intermodal units. Um, it's, uh, you know, the, again, the uh, inter intermodal, uh, and, this, and this goes back to, 20, uh, to 2011, and uh, the uh, numbers are uh, are, are they they have they have come back they're, uh, they're a steady gain and uh, hopefully they'll continue to climb car loads eh, not so great but uh, again we'll see where that goes so and okay I wonder if anybody heard that oh whoops okay okay so <laughs> uh, I, I decided to, to use uh, use the term here uh, uh, early 21st century freight rail. And uh, well, what's he talking about? Well, wait a minute. Yeah, well, this is the early 21st century. And, and the reason why I decided to uh, 
use this phrase, early 21st century uh, freight rails, because we are at an inflection point. And I, and I think we're going to see some, some really big changes uh, coming with it over the next five years. So, so let's take a look at where we are. Uh, we are in the, uh, in the middle of uh, everybody's favorite acronym, PSR, <laughs> Precision Scheduled Railroading. Uh, I've heard some other acronyms for that, uh, uh, some, some other terms for that, like uh, 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 pure stockholders reward, but again, I'm editorializing. Um, the long-term benefits, I think they're unproved. Uh, railroads, in my opinion, like, like CN and CP, I think they've evolved to the next level. You know, they've had a lot of experience with their versions of PSR, uh, and I think they've got it down pretty good. Uh, CSX um, is, is, is doing better, but, uh, you know, Hunter Harrison came in and, and you know, so I like to say Hunter came in, took CSX, turned it upside down and shook it violently. And, uh, uh, and there was there was some some pretty serious hiccups, uh, but uh, you know I think things are starting to smooth out. Uh, everyone has their own version of uh, of PSR. Um, uh, Kansas City Southern, uh, if be instructive to to uh, look at uh, uh, Pat Ottensmeyer's interview with me for Railroad of the Year, and uh, uh, I, th I think the KCS is uh, uh, is is focused on growth. Uh, Norfolk Southern uh, in, in the midst of their transformation, Union Pacific. The only one that hasn't joined the PSR bandwagon is BNSF, uh, because BNSF uh, is not is not beholden to uh, to the analysts who do, on Wall Street. Um, I think, with with all due respect to uh, to to some of them, you know, people like Tony Hatch and uh, our own uh, our own Jason Seidel from Cowan and Company. Um, so, um, uh, sure, and I'm being sarcastic here. Short term Wall Street, DGIS. Uh, short term, you know, they talk about long term benefits. Well, they're not looking long term, they're looking to the next quarter. DGI, DGIS, short term Wall Street doesn't give a blank. So, but I'm, I'm generalizing. We've heard some rumblings about um, mergers and acquisitions. Uh, um, Kansas City Southern, as, uh, as, as you know, is, is still independent. Uh, they, they did have a, uh, an infrastructure fund come with a very substantial offer and the folks at KCS said, nope, not interested. So that's died down. Um, but it did drive the stock price up to $208 a share. I don't own any, but maybe I should have bought some. Um, Here's a here's a point. The next point for me is is, is something that uh, that has kind of gotten to me uh, over the years. Um, if you've read some of my editorials, the hedge fund invasion and disruption, we hope it's over. Um, to me, hedge funds have their place, but uh, but the hedge funds are not focused on long term growth, uh, long term profitability, and overall sustainability and health of the industry. So we hope that uh, the Ackmans. Uh, of the world are uh, will leave us alone at least for a while. Uh, coal, King Coal, fading fast. Um, I'll make a prediction. Could coal be gone within a decade? Well, our, our coal reserves uh, are uh, are being uh, are being depleted. Um, if there are, uh, there have been a lot of conversions of uh, energy plants to natural gas, they will not be converted back to coal. Um, clean coal has been talked about, but clean coal is kind of an oxymoron. Um, so, uh, but I think, I think the railroads uh, uh, realize that, um, you know, that uh, they cannot depend upon uh, coal as a major source of revenue, even though the margins are very high. So, so what's the future? Well, intermodal, intermodal, intermodal. It's like, it's like, uh, what, what, what do you call good? Uh, what, what's, what's this? What is the foundation of good track or good ballast? Drainage, 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 right? So I think, I think for our industry, it's intermodal, intermodal, intermodal. That's, that's where we're headed. Um, we had a, uh, a reboot of, of NAFTA, the USMCA, uh, United States, Mexico, Canada agreement. Uh, despite uh, certain politicians calling it uh, NAFTA a disaster, uh, it was not a disaster. It worked, uh, it worked very well, especially when you consider that more than 40% of 
the railroad revenue, uh, railroad traffic is dependent upon international trade. So I like to call the USMCA merely NAFTA 2.0. And Pat Ottensmeyer, who, who helped negotiate, uh, was part of the U.S. Mexico-Canada agreement, working with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and the Secretary of State, other entities, um, the uh, other groups uh, of CEOs. Um, he said, I asked him, I said, well, Pat, what's the difference between NAFTA and the USMCA? And he said, it's really just an update. Uh, yeah, there were, there, there were some good provisions that, um, uh, that helped in terms of labor rates, things like that, but really it was updating NAFTA to become uh, to, to be in step with a lot of the technology that's available now in terms of shipment tracking, customs clearances, uh, uh, so on and so forth. Really quickly, uh, as an industry, as I said, we have responded to COVID-19 and the industry is taking care of itself. And I, and I mean the, the freight rail industry, you know, we, we, we have not uh, needed uh, financial assistance uh, from Congress. So we did, we have done, and we're still doing what we need to do, you know, protecting our employees, protecting our customers, putting in the measures. Uh, all the CEOs that I have talked with uh, over the past uh, six months or so, uh, Carl Ice, uh, Pat Ottensmeyer, um, JJ Ruest, you know, they're all, Everybody's uh, uh, people at Union Pacific, uh, Jim Vayner, their chief operating officer, you know, as far as the, the procedures in place for uh, not only protecting their employees and putting in the measures that uh, for, for social distance, and it's tough to do, you know, well, crew change points, uh, you know, staffing, all that, uh, working, working out of the house, you know, the, you, you've got to keep, you can't dispatch, well, at least these days, you can't necessarily dispatch a railroad out of somebody's house, uh, although that might be kind of fun. So what do you do, Dad? Well, I work down in the basement, and I dispatch the Union Pacific. That might be kind of fun, but um, so we're taking care of ourselves, we're taking care of, of, our, of our customers, and we are also moving the necessary goods or the raw materials that, that we need uh, for, for handling the medical issues in this pandemic. Uh, I won't start talking about toilet paper, but you know, that's paper products, okay? Uh, there is a growing realization, moving on to the next point, that we as an industry must identify new markets. That, that is a must. Uh, there are a lot of, um, industry observers and analysts that say, well, we're not growing it. We're not growing our business. You know, we're not, we're not seeking out new, new sources of traffic. We're not growing carload business. You know, we're being too selective. Uh, uh, you know, where, whereas, you know, we're not, we're, 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 lo we're, we're lowering our expenses. We're lowering costs, which is a good thing, but are we growing, uh, are we growing, are we growing the top line, you know, uh, to, to bring that bot is the bottom line coming up? Because we're because we're growing the top line, or is the bottom line coming up because because the expense side is coming down? Um, it's a work in progress, and I think uh, part of dealing with that is uh, the fact that as an industry, the railroads are starting to realize that that they or we are really part of a, a global supply chain uh you know you look at you, you look at uh, i i think probably one of uh, two two of the best examples of that um are rcn and uh um and kansas city southern um and bnsf to a uh, to a good extent because there's so much um, uh you know they, they don't look at themselves as purely as a railroad but but as part of an overall global supply chain which includes uh, what we would consider competitive modes, which uh, you know, it's it's the uh, it's it might be uh, really trucking for the most part, you know, um, and and trying to become fully integrated into that supply chain, and that's where we're going to get into in, in a little bit to talk about uh, some of the the technologies that are now being being adopted. Positive train control, huge investment for the industry, freight and passenger, uh, somewhere around $15 billion. So thanks to the leadership, uh, 
and I say this without reservation, the leadership of our Federal Railroad Administrator, Ron Vittori, who brought 44 years of railroad experience, operational experience to the Federal Railroad Administration, uh, or the industry is, um, is inching up. I think we're, the last report was of nine, about 99% implementation. So now we're starting to think about PTC 2.0, and I'll get into that uh, in just a little bit. Uh, that leads me to, to my next point, advanced technology, adoption uh, of that is gaining momentum. But again, it's gradually, you know, this, our industry typically doesn't do things rapidly, doesn't do things overnight. Um, but, uh, but we can see, we can see that there are many advanced technologies that are, are gradually being adopted. And I think that, I think the pace, uh, the, the pace is picked up. Uh, finally, uh, right now, COVID-19 has forced a hard look at how and why we do things. So as far as the freight railroads are concerned, and I just pinged myself, okay. And there is Mr. Batori, <laughs> who's a very honorable person. Uh, and I think I, and I, I chose this, I chose this, this photo because, uh, you know, when it comes to testifying before Congress, he's very straight uh, and very fair, but don't get on his bad side because he'll set the record straight. And say, I think I know who he's pointing at, but, but here's a quote uh, from Ron. Okay. And, and this is in our uh, October issue on a, a uh, it actually accompanies a piece by the, uh, by the FRA Research uh, Development uh, and uh, Technology Department. Proper application of artificial intelligence can create less operational risk and afford a safer environment. Continuous strengthening of the predictive algorithms associated with artificial intelligence can deliver endless value toward eliminating variability thus creating more productive capacity. Smarter railroading in the years ahead can be achieved by advancing use of AI technology. Um, that's, a lot, that's a lot of words, but you know something? Ron Vittori is one of these folks who, you know, when, 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 he, when, he, when he uses a lot of words, he's actually saying something. Um, and and let's, hope, let's hope that uh, people are, are paying attention. I think they are. So with that, I will move on to, ah, whoops, I think I, I think I, uh, ah, here we go. Okay, going a little too fast on the buttons there. So what could freight rail look like post COVID? These uh, points here are, are really taken from the conversations that I've had with a lot of people in this industry and not just, not just since March, okay? Uh, but actually, actually over the past few years. So, so what, uh, what could a new normal look like or what, are, or what is behind uh, the new normal? Well, look at what we're doing now. Uh, I, I'm an example. Consumer goods bought and sold online, requiring real-time tracking, just-in-time logistics, and a need for packaging materials. So that's paper products, okay? And, and, I, and a couple of the CEOs that I've talked to have said, yes, you know, uh, we supply the raw materials um, for, for, for packaging, um, and that means more, uh, more forest products possibly, uh, depending upon what that packaging is. You know, it could be plastic pellets, it could, it could be pulp, whatever it is, but the packaging materials, okay? Uh, renewable energy and electric vehicles are gradually replacing fossil fuel energy and vehicles. And you're talking to a guy who's a car guy, okay? I drive a, a 2009 uh, Australian Pontiac G8 GT, with a V8 that I've got tweaked up to 500 horsepower. You know, it'll smoke the tires in four gears, but so uh, I'm not an environmentalist when it comes to cars, but <laughs> I, was, I was thinking of including a slide of it. I said, ah, you know. Um, so renewable energy, uh, which means um, more solar power probably, more, uh, more hydropower. Um, <clears throat> 
sustainable sources of, of energy, replacing coal and probably and maybe even someday replacing natural gas. And, and, and that means a drop in the amount of petroleum products that will, that will be moved, uh, whether it's by rail or by pipeline. Electric vehicles. <clears throat> now, how does, how does that impact the freight rail industry? Well, uh, not so much, maybe not so much uh, freight railroads, but maybe more on the uh, uh, passenger side having to do with uh, motor, motor vehicle fuels ta fuel tax. So uh, where, where some of that money will go into a trust fund, a state trans fund, trust fund that goes into transit. But um, some will say that uh, electric vehicles, uh, electric trucks specifically will increase um, competition. Um, uh, you have on the one on the one extreme, you have Elon Musk, who at one point said, "Well, my my autonomous electric trucks are gonna are gonna wipe out intermodal." No, I don't think so. I don't think so, Elon. Uh, uh, you know, I, I don't think any, anybody wants to be uh, wants to be driving next to a, a convoy of uh, twenty trucks with nobody at the wheel. Um, but I think it is inevitable that uh, uh, electric uh, electric power uh, electric power vehicles will eventually replace uh, fossil fuel like gasoline and even diesel so but the real change is is which is occurring right now is uh, rapid deployment or, or speeded up deployment of artificial intelligence big data driven technology adoption um, some of this or a lot of this uh, is, going to, is going to be made possible by the next generation of positive train control, PTC 2.0. PTC has a lot of bandwidth available. Right now, PTC uh, 1.0, as we call it, is, is a safety overlay, okay? But you take the bandwidth that's available, you take the communications bandwidth, and there are, there are a lot of communication-based technologies that can be, that can use that communications platform to provide the information for running a quote-unquote smart railroad. And um, I remember that term being used uh, 20, 25 years ago uh, by, by an executive at, uh, at Norfolk Southern, um, uh, John, uh, John Samuels. Um, oops. Sorry about that. I don't want you to see that right away. <laughs> Got a sneak peek. So, so what are we looking at in terms of the, the technology that is being deployed as we speak, but it's in its early stages. And, uh, and so continuous real time track and signal inspection and, uh, and, fl and flaw detection. Okay. Uh, there's i uh, uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, the CN has a program where they are mounting track inspection geometry equipment and rail flaw uh, detection equipment on a freight car that typically is carried right behind the locomotive. And, um, and it has all the electronic gear on it and it's actually inspecting the track in a moving train, in a revenue train. So you don't have to take the track out of service. Uh, you don't, you know, you don't need time blocks for uh, for high rail high rail cars. Uh, uh, you can do this with artificial intelligence, and all the and, and this the the data can be gathered at speed. Um, so CN is doing is doing this at trains moving on the main lines at 40, 30, 40, 50 miles an hour. Europeans are doing it on on their high speed trains moving at almost two hundred miles an hour. Think about that. Uh, machine learning or uh, also known as machine vision, something that, that we covered, uh, cover story of our, of our September issue. Um, arrays of high-speed cameras uh, that, that photograph at high speed the running gear as it's going by and can look for and detect uh, faults in, uh, in, in three-piece trucks, faults, faults in brake gear, faults in couplers, wheels, axles um, you and you, you you couple that with all the other all the other detection technologies that are out there today uh, uh, ul ultrasonic uh, uh, hotbox detection there's, there's I could I could 
I could list list a ton of them, but but they're they're all out there. Continuous real time vehicle health monitoring. This is this has become fairly common. You know, you have systems on the locomotives um, uh, systems by uh, Wabtec, which actually uh, former General Electric, uh, Wytronics, companies like that. Uh, that that there are essentially black boxes on board the locomotives that are that are monitoring what the what the locomotive is doing every system all right whether whether it's whether it's the prime mover whether it's the traction alternator you know all all the various measurements of, of temperature and pressure um, all of this stuff the electronics everything is being monitored in real time and if there's a and if there's a problem it goes it goes to a trouble desk or it goes to a monitoring system whether it's whether it's in house or whether it's contracted um, so when the so when a locomotive arrives at a terminal it can be diagnosed and and the problem can be re remedied almost on the spot all right? and this all this all helps uh, not only utilization but it helps the overall flow of the railroad overall velocity this ties in with with predictive maintenance which very simply stated is uh, is finding a fault and uh, taking care of it before it becomes a problem, before it causes a, a road, a line of road failure or a derailment in the worst case scenario. Um, next point, <laughs> uh, contentious of course, uh, single person crews, uh, attended autonomous train operation and where appropriate, where appropriate driverless operation. Uh, the Australians are running driverless trains uh, out, out, out in the outback uh, on some of these these long haul ore trains where there's you know there's, there's nobody around basically. Um, but it can can it, it would it be would it be po possible here? Of course it would. Would it be appropriate in a, in an urban setting running a, a driverless train? Well, probably not. But uh, you know driverless we we may see that again where appropriate. Uh, single person crews. Uh, um, I say attended autonomous train operation. I I was witness to uh, to one of these. I was on board uh, a little less than a, a little less than a year ago. I went out to TTCI, uh, courtesy of Progress Rail, and I experienced firsthand in the cab their Talus system uh, at a uh, freight train with uh, I think eighty or ninety loaded coal cars and. Uh, three units up front and uh, one or two units uh, shoving at the rear. And, um, and this, the, the, there was an engineer attending the, uh, attending the train. We went around, we went around the loop, a uh, good 15 mile loop. And uh, as I like to say, uh, the damn thing ran itself. <laughs> um, that's the future. You know, we're, we're moving from locomotive assist to engineer assist, which help help the engineer uh, operate the train more efficiently. It's, it's, all, it's all, a lot of it's based on fuel, fuel savings, reducing fuel consumption. The next level is, is running semi-autonomously. So somewhere down the road, PTC 2.0 can support moving block traffic control. And uh, I'm sure, most of you know what that is, but uh, it's being it's used in this, um, significantly in, in the transit world on captive systems on metros mainly, communication-based train control. But moving block traffic control, where the train is actually moving within its own clearance envelope, so that increases capacity. Uh, eventually, eventually. Uh, you will not need wayside hardware. You really don't. You, you really won't. Everything, uh, everything, everything you need to know. You know uh, the the locomotive engineer, everything that he or she needs to know is on a is on a cab display. So that so that cuts down wayside hardware. Of course, cuts down on costs. It cuts down on the need for uh, inspection, uh, manual inspection. Um, just to uh, uh, I, I think one th one thing that I that I, I didn't I didn't touch upon here is uh, uh, in terms of uh, real time health monitoring that also applies to uh, signaling and, tra and train control. 
uh, gray crossing devices, uh, interlocking controllers, um, um, uh, things like, uh, for example, like batteries uh, that, uh, that, that, that control uh, uh, active warning devices on crossings. So all these things, all these things can, their health can be monitored in real time, which means that you don't, that you don't necessarily have to uh, have to send an inspector out once a week or, or how, uh, whatever the requirement is, you know, if it's 30 days, maybe you can move to a 90 day. And this, of course, this is federal regulation. The FRA has to, has to be on board with this. I think they are. I, I think I know they are. Uh, I know they're looking at it. Uh, um, uh, that goes back to, uh, to, uh, to what Ron Vittori said about artificial intelligence. So now, does that mean that jobs are going to be eliminated? Well, I don't, not necessarily. I think, um, I think if that means that, that we're more efficient, uh, that we're more cost effective and we're safer, hopefully that will attract more traffic to the rails. And so we're going to need people, we're going to need the same amount of people, but doing different things, okay? So my final point with technology, um, uh, and these are things that have been uh, either been tried or they are in, are in trial, battery power. Um, the, uh, Wabtech has, has picked up on, um, on what GE was doing, experimenting with a, with a battery operated locomotive or a, or a hybrid power uh, energy storage. LNG, well, at one point, um, you know, looking at pretty serious tests on, uh, on LNG actually that, uh, that's nothing new. If, uh, if, if Steve Dittmeyer is, is listening, uh, I hope he is, uh, uh, you know, Steve, uh, when he was at the BN, uh, 30 years ago was working with, with, uh, liquefied natural gas, uh, CSX, CN, BNSF, UP have, have tested that Florida East coast is running liquefied natural gas powered, uh, locomotives uh, in, in regular service, doing quite well with them actually. But the FEC is kind of a captive system, so they don't have the, they don't have the, uh, and, and they also have a subsidiary of the Florida East Coast Industries that they can generate their own LNG. So, so, it's, so they, they have a, ready, a readily available supply of that fuel and it works for them. Um, and it's retrofit. Uh, their, their unit, their locomotives are, are, are General Wabtec, General Electric, um, and, they're, uh, and they use a mix of uh, LNG and, um, uh, and diesel. And there's still a percentage of diesel uh, to uh, initiate compression ignition, whether it's 5%, uh, 10%, uh, 20%. A pure LNG locomotive would require a spark ignition. CNG, compressed natural gas, is also being looked at. Uh, there's, uh, there is a company, uh, CN, uh, CNG Motive, that, uh, that's run by, uh, by Dave Scott, who uh, came from EMD. Uh, he's got a, um, uh, got a test. Uh, and again, things, some things have stalled with COVID, but uh, there is, I've seen the technology. Uh, and it's, uh, the Norfolk Southern is supposed to be testing it. Uh, uh, quite soon. We hope to see that. Okay. So the end result uh, or the ongoing result uh, we hope is going to be that railroad and it's bottom line railroads, freight railroads gain ton mile market share, which is already pretty strong at about 40%, but more important revenue market share. Um, and I don't think there's a, there's a railroader or an observer or an analyst out there who, who wouldn't want to see us, uh, the freight, our freight railroads gain revenue market share. So on to passenger. <laughs> this is one of, my, one of my favorite, the old Frankenstein movie from, uh, from 19, uh, 1930. That's, you can't see his face. Uh, that's Boris Karloff there as the monster. It's alive, it's alive, the passenger rail. So yeah, it's, uh, it is on life support at the moment. Uh, as we know, traffic, uh, or rather ridership has fallen off uh, severely. It's, it's starting to come back, but it's still, uh, it's still pretty bad. Uh, and it's gonna be a while uh, before it gets back to, uh, to normal, whatever that's gonna be, uh, although, uh, sadly, 
we seem to be entering a second wave of, uh, uh, of this coronavirus. And uh, uh, if that happens, uh, I, th I think the recovery is going to take, take a bit longer. So, so the point is, uh, you know, and, and, and this really steams me, and I'm sure it steams a lot of you in the passenger industry, whether, uh, you know, whether, you're, uh, whether you're running Metra or New York City Transit uh, or the CTA or NJ Transit or Amtrak, you know, well, it's not safe to ride on a, uh, on a train. You know, it's not, it isn't safe. You know, it's uh, social distancing, this, this, and that. It isn't safe. Well, you know, you should be in your car. The private car is the safest place to be. I don't think so. Uh, I, I think we can make a strong argument uh, against that. So it will come back to life, but I think in a slightly different form. So, so what's going to change? Okay. So passenger rail uh, post COVID. So the, our, our agencies uh, are doing their best to adjust to, uh, to a, the new normal. So what is the new normal in terms of ridership patronage? What are the drivers behind that? Well, um, again, I'll use myself as, as an example, flexible working hours and working from home. A lot more people are, uh, I, I think, working from home for some of us has worked out very well, um, has for me. And, uh, uh, but that means that, um, you know, the, the traditional rush hour, uh, morning in, you know, for commuters, more morning in, evening home, um, that that will change. So that's going to mean that the the type of service that 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 we provide. And I'm really talking about commuter rail. I think you know, subways, um, CTA, uh, New York City Transit systems like that run around the clock or almost around the clock. You know, that won't change. Um, you need that frequency. You need that 24-hour service. Um, but but uh, commuter rail, if your if if your schedule is based on you know heavy inbound in the morning and heavy outbound in the evening, you, I think there's probably going to have to be some some adjustments to that. Okay, the need for social distancing if it's required. Well, yeah, can, uh, it's being done. Yeah, you can do that. You you limit you limit the number of uh, if you can the limit you limit the number of of, uh, of people that can be on board a car at one point. Um, that you, there are uh, uh, other things, you know, you, you can require use of masks. Um, there's, there's a lot of things that, uh, that can be done. It's not easy, okay? It is not easy. Um, there are, there are some pretty innovative things being done. Uh, one of them, I'll, I'll give one example of Long Island Railroad has, uh, uh, has uh, uh, they've added to their, their uh, mobile phone, their smartphone application, uh, a function that will actually tell you, the commuter, the rider, how many people are on board a particular car. And they use measurements. They can they 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 integrate this technology with the um, uh, with the air suspension in the car that can tell you how many people are in a particular car and how the weight is distributed by how the car is sitting on on the trucks, uh, how it's sitting on the um, on the uh, uh, suspension system. Okay, um, you know I I think. Uh, we will see a renewed focus on reducing uh, uh, automobile uh, traffic congestion and pollution. Um, I've, I, I've seen photos of uh, uh, the smog in Los Angeles and the smog in, in, in New York City during the pandemic. It wasn't there. You could actually see, see things. Um, so, you know, is that, um, is, is, that, is that a temporary thing? Well, we hope not. You know, uh, we, we, we hope that, that, uh, that as a society, we can see that, yes, we can reduce pollution, okay? Whether, and it's, it's a combination of um, getting away from fossil fuels, but also more reliance on, on, on public transportation, mainly rail, okay? So, and, and here's something, here's something that, that some people might, might consider a bit of a stretch, a recognition that environmentally sound public transportation helps reduce 
climate change and in turn improves uh, global health. Uh, oh my goodness, uh, it's 4.50, I've been rambling on here. Okay, I'll try to, uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll try to speed up. Uh, so, you know, climate change has all, all kinds of environmental effects which could, uh, uh, could contribute to diseases coming out of nowhere like, like COVID-19. But I think as an industry, the passenger rail, we need to integrate with and not push back against things like autonomous vehicles, like ride sharing and other, other what we call disruptive technologies. Um, so again, artificial intelligence, big data driven technology. Uh, these are, uh, okay, I think I skipped here, here we go. Same thing, many of the same technologies freight rail has embraced, okay? Uh, but added to that, integrated, seamless automated fare collection, continuous real-time passenger information, uh, vehicle designs and materials that are conducive to frequent deep cleaning, touchless passenger interfaces like door controls. All this technology is available, okay? And it all can be retrofitted. Uh, and again, alternative propulsion method, methods, Hi hydrogen fuel cell, battery, hybrid. Uh, Alstom has a hydrogen fuel cell vehicle in Germany that is now in revenue service. So like freight, we hope that passenger rail gain ridership and, and revenue market share, and I think it can. So uh, with that, time has, gotten, time has gotten away from me. So uh, I'm going to thank everyone here and uh, I'll, I'll I'll take your questions. There's my favorite jazz musician, Buddy Rich, who famously said at one point, you have a request? I don't take requests. This is my band. I play what I want. But, uh, but this is your public, Railway Age, this is your publication, and, and we write what, what you want to hear, hopefully. Thank you, Bill. So, appreciate that uh, presentation. Um, I'd like to uh, invite Norm uh, back up. Hi, Norm. Uh, Norm, I know you had some guests you wanted to uh, bring on board. Did you want to do that before hey, after Q&A? Uh, why don't we go ahead with Q&A and maybe we can take a few minutes past uh, four o'clock central if people are still willing to listen because I think Bill has a hard stop. Okay, we have a, a large number of questions, so I'm going to do my best to uh, attack a few of them. Um, I'm going to say right now we probably don't have time to answer everyone's questions. Um, but if but, you send them to me, if you send them to me if with questions we don't get to, if you send them to me, I'd be happy to, an to, to answer them. All right, so. we'll see what we can do about that. I think yeah. we can do that. Okay. Okay, let me... Uh, I'm going to read the names of the uh, people that have asked these questions, and then, you know, we're going to go down the list here real quick. But uh, so Peter Scozzi asks, how long till electric locomotives replace diesel? Any thoughts on that? I don't, th I don't think uh, we will see that uh, only because the infrastructure costs for electrification are so high, very high. Uh, the, the only scenario I could see is, uh, is if, um, uh, and I think the BNSF has looked at this at one point, uh, if you could use the right of way as a, uh, as, as a, as a grid to carry general, you know, to, to carry electric power and then tap off of that for electrification. Uh, but the infrastructure costs, the uh, building electrification, um, maintaining it are very, very high. And there's, you know, and we've reached the point with uh, fuel efficiency and diesel locomotives and other technologies available that uh, uh, electrification just doesn't make sense from a cost standpoint. Thank you. Uh, Richard Gill asks, uh, how are railroads doing attracting new managerial talent? Uh, what skills are they most in need of? Um, I, I, th I think they're doing an overall good job. Uh, there, there, ha there has been a uh, um, sort of a, a brain drain or uh, intellectual, uh, not intellectual, but uh, uh, what am I thinking of here? Not, not intellectual property. Uh, boy, uh, I'm the one with the brain drain right now. 
uh, institutional knowledge, there you go, uh, with, with so many retirements after railroad retirement was revised a few years ago. But railroads are actively recruiting uh, uh, young people and they're trying, trying to adapt to make it, make, uh, retain this, this, this young talent. Uh, we see examples of it. Uh, you know, we have we have our uh, up and coming uh, under forty uh, honorees every year. We get a lot of applicants for those. Uh, you know, it's I think once people get into get into this industry, they see it's a great industry to work in. It's a wonderful industry to work in. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, I th I think, and especially with the adoption of, of, of <clears throat> some of these new technologies. Um, it's becoming more and more attractive to young people. So I think we're doing a, pre a pretty good job at that. And we'll, we'll, certainly, we'll certainly see that continue. Great, thanks. Uh, George Hamlin asks, uh, have you read any of the recent prognostications about railroading in 24 that was in the November issue of Trains Magazine? If so, any reaction? So this could be a quick answer. Um, no, <laughs> no, no disrespect, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, no, no disrespect to, uh, to trains, to a great, uh, I, I hate to sound like the president, terrific magazine, great magazine, it's wonderful, uh, um, but I, I just, I just haven't had time to, to, to look at it, but, uh, so, so I, so I George highlighted a few topics, but since you haven't read it, I think we'll move on to, uh, some of the okay. next questions. Uh, okay. Scott Sigmund asks, uh, he says, um, what is the outlook post COVID-19 area for class three railroads uh, separating the handful of holding conglomerates like Genesee, Wyoming, Watco, et cetera, from the others uh, that have less capital investment capacity or legacy technology and fewer track miles and, and defined customer bases. So any thoughts on the class? Well, well, you know, I, I think uh, as they always have had, uh, it's a, uh, it, 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 in terms of what they can invest, it's, uh, it, it is problematic, but there are funding streams <coughs> available, which uh, uh, RIF loans and uh, CMAC grants, so, yeah, they have to be, uh, they have to be creative. They have to really, because there are multiple sources of, of funding available, government funding available that, that are geared toward um, efficiency, uh, redu reducing traffic congestion, pollution, so on and so forth. And uh, they really have to be creative with that. And I also know that there are, uh, uh, there are a number of uh, suppliers out there that are gearing their efforts toward making the products uh, of high technology, new technology affordable. And I think as time goes by, as these technologies are adopted on a wide scale, like anything, the price of the prices uh, of these technologies, the price of acquisition and the price of implementation uh, will will come down. A lot of companies are offering, for example, what's called SaaS software as a service, uh, where you don't have to host the software platform, uh, but but your your vendor does. So so I I, I think uh, I think the prospects are good, and I think the entrepreneurial nature of Class Three railroads I think is to their advantage. Uh, Kel Silberberg uh, said he's looking for information on the effect of the 1918-1920 pandemic on the railroads, more on the personal or personnel and process changes and economic changes. Mm -hmm. And is curious if you're aware of any sources of information um, about what happened in that previous pandemic that we can apply to today's circumstances. Yes. Uh, in fact, uh, I would uh, uh, classic trains and trains magazine is actually a very good source uh, uh, with trains and classic trains uh, we're fortunate where I think they've digitized all their archives uh, recently uh, uh, Kevin Keefe their former former publisher uh, you know he has he has a, a very good blog very good column going uh, where he talked about that and he actually he actually quoted railway age and I <laughs> going back to our 1918. Uh, there's a lot of information available uh, uh, from us, but it's not, it's, you know, you have to go to a library to get it the old fashioned way. I hope that someday we will digitize our, our archives, but, but yeah, I would, I would recommend Comback Com Publishing. Yeah, they're, uh, they're, they're very, very good with that. Great, thanks. Um, not the train. <laughs> uh, Joseph Olson asks, he said, if Texas Central High Speed Rail 
and Brightline high-speed rail succeed, do you see more private passenger railroad developments in other high traffic regions? I do, I do. Um, you know, uh, what's, what's the movie, the phrase, uh, build it and they will come. Uh, you know, once you've got one system up and running that works um, and that, that's attracting, uh, uh, attracting ridership and, and is, is financially sustainable, uh, I think we'll see other, other examples pop up around the country. I, I really do. But somebody's got to get it. Somebody's got to get a system running first. Somebody's got to do it. They, hopefully it'll, it'll be one of these two operations. Norm, it's four o'clock. Are you okay with a few more questions? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I'm okay. I've got a. Right. So, uh, Bill, yeah. you had to leave too. How much more time do you have, Bill? Oh, I can. Um, I, I can probably uh, you can squeeze in another five, six, seven minutes. Uh, okay. You know, I have All a right. high school alumni association board meeting. Those guys can wait. <laughs> well, we'll try to keep it to about five minutes. I'll, I'm keeping track okay. of time. I just yeah, okay. asks. Norm, I'm sorry, Norm. And then I'll jump in in five minutes. Great. Okay. Uh, James Daly asks, he said, given the revenue pressures on passenger rail because of COVID-19, what is your outlook for commuter rail capital spending in 2021? Well, um, I, 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 that's, that's, gonna, that's gonna depend largely uh, upon the financial condition of, of individual states and also the federal government. Um, I, I know that uh, uh, with the drop with the drop in traffic uh, we have now, a lot of the railroads uh, are actually doing uh, they're doing work ahead of time. I know Metro's doing that, uh, NJ Transit, the MTA in New York. Uh, you know there are projects that uh, they're taking advantage of the time or the track time and the lower the lower uh, traffic density. Um, it's hard. It's hard to say. It, it really is, is. Is hard to say. Uh, my hope is that it'll it'll be strong. My hope is that, uh, regardless of who is in the White House, uh, my hope is that the Federal Transit Administration and the FRA, uh, but it's really the FTA on the federal side uh, that will will keep the dollars flowing. We hope. Uh, there are two questions related to intermodal. I'll ask back to back and uh, you can address them. Uh, so Craig Phillip asks, he says, um, intermodal growth will require short, fast trains and frequent service. How does that pivot happen so long as PSR is the focus? And Max Ng asks, um, what has been done or will be done for railroad companies to best adapt to the demand um, from intermodal? Wow, uh, PSR. Hmm. Well, I think uh, I, I think you have to look at the PSR. Really, is not geared toward intermodal trains. It's really geared toward carload traffic. And uh, I think as long as the, the railroads can can keep uh, keep that separated, okay, and and keep and keep running running their their fast trains, and they don't necessarily the intermodal trains. They don't necessarily have to be short, okay. BNSF runs very long stack trains on, on, on the Southern Transcon at 70 miles an hour. So it's really, it's really more a function of, of keeping the track in good, safe condition to be able to operate intermodal trains at that speed, at, the, at those speeds, uh, and having the power available. Uh, um, and having the, having the network capacity to be able to, you know, run a faster train around a slower train. Uh, you know whether it's a um, uh, you know whether it's it's a uh, it's a dispatching function or whether it's just simple more double track with more crossovers and some smart dispatching and smart algorithms and uh, uh, you know uh, meet and pass planning. It's a lot of it has to do with technology, but mainly it's got it's got to do with a good, solid, safe infrastructure that can handle higher speeds. Can it be done? Yes. William, thanks. Time for maybe. Will it be done? One more. Oh, sorry to interrupt. <laughs> maybe time for one or two more quick questions. Okay. Uh, Willem uh, Cooper sure. asks, uh, he'd like to know how Canada is doing on uh, PTC uh, technology advancement front compared with the United States. 
Okay. Well, Canada, uh, Canada does not, does not have the uh, federal requirement for PTC, but the, the Canadian railroads, I know that the uh, CN, uh, CP in particular, are, are working on their own version of, of PTC. Um, I think to, to uh, get a handle on what's, um, uh, what's, what's happening in Canada, uh, I would, uh, here's a plug, I would tune into our uh, Next Generation Train Control Conference, which is next week online, October 20th, 21st. Also, uh, Rail Insights Canada on the 27th virtual conference where we'll, you know, we'll ask some of those questions. But there, uh, there, is, there are PTC initiatives uh, underway, but they don't have the pressure of having a deadline and having to, having to do all this, you know, all the, make, make, make the investment. Uh, here's our last question for today. It goes back to intermodal. Uh, Bill Frito asks, uh, and there's a little preamble here, and he says, you cite intermodal, intermodal, intermodal as the foundation, but then also note a growing realization that new markets must be identified. These are not necessarily contradictory, but many would argue that new markets will have to be addressed by something other than inter intermodal. Uh, discussions in many formats about car load, especially boxcars, often go hand in hand uh, with discussions about whether intermodal can penetrate shorter haul markets. Meanwhile, the railroads don't seem to be interested in anything other than intermodal to take cargo off the highways. Uh, so what are the potential markets and how might they be captured if intermodal is not the answer. Well, um, uh, things like, well, and I think I think anything that can be carried in a box car, almost anything in terms of a commu uh, uh, consumer goods, uh, uh, can be carried in a container uh, or a trailer. And uh, so when you when you're when, when that stuff is carried in a container or a trailer. Uh, it doesn't have to be necessarily have to be transloaded to a truck. You, you lift the container off the train and you put it onto a truck. Uh, it's a little less complicated. That, that's probably an over, overly simplistic uh, uh, explanation. But, uh, but again, getting back to what I said uh, about the consumer market changing, people, more people, instead of going shopping to a store, they're going to order their goods online. That's going to require uh, more more of the FedEx, FedEx, more UPS, uh, more uh, DHL, okay? And that's the type of traffic that for the long haul moves best on a train. Now you can argue whether it should be in a box car or a, or a container. I would say a container only because of the relative simplicity and the convenience of, uh, of, of not only, uh, you know, the transfer from, the, from one chassis, the flat car or the well car, to the truck chassis, but also that the, tra the shipment tracking goes with not only the container, okay, but, but with, with the item itself, but really the container. Um, can, can the same technology be applied to the tracking technology, shipment tracking technology be applied to a boxcar? Of course it can, but, but, that, but the, the systems are, are already in place for, for the trucking portion of it. And it would just have to be seamlessly integrated with, with, with the rail portion of it. So it comes down, it comes down to, again, it, it comes down to technology, artificial intelligence, real-time information. Thanks, Bill. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone for their questions. I know we did not get to every single one of them, uh, but thanks again. And I'd like to hand it the floor over to Norm. Uh, Brett, if you could activate uh, Stanton Lewin and Robert Griggs, uh, I hope they w at least one of them is on here. And while you're doing that, let me just finish up what we were talking about. At Metro's uh, 49th Street facility and 47th Street, we've invested $32 million to increase the capacity there. And basically, we are in the business of insourcing. I repeat that, insourcing. And so far, the insourcing work that we have done on our, our passenger cars, rehab, rehabilitation of passenger cars and rehabilitation of locomotives has created value for the citizens of Illinois of roughly $200 million, of which 125 million of that is savings on doing it inside 
and 75 to 77 million dollars in payroll for people that we have hired so that uh, we have the ability for those people to reinvest their payroll checks in Illinois, which even adds more benefit. So that's what we're doing. And uh, I see that uh, Rob Griggs is on the line. And uh, Rob, maybe you could talk a little bit about my Metra and particularly the, clean, the cleaning programs we are having and the outreach to the markets, both the press and our passengers to bring them back to, uh, to Metra. Sure. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Robert Griggs and I work in Metro's marketing department. I'm uh, glad to be here and thank Norm for the invite. Excuse me, I'm sorry, Robert, but Robert if, and Norm, if I can just interrupt for a second. I know Bill's gonna have to drop off, so I just wanted to make sure we all thank uh, Bill for his presentation today, because I didn't do that when I thanked the uh, people who sent in questions, so thanks, Bill. And again, You're very welcome. Sorry thank to interrupt, you. Robert, but thank no, you no. very much, and I'll no turn it back over to Rob. All right. Okay. Thanks very much, uh, Robert. Nice to meet you, uh, thank you Norm. Thank you for inviting me, uh, Joan and uh, and Brett. Thanks so much. It was it was a pleasure. Got to go to my alumni high school board meeting. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Take care. Okay. Okay, so and as I was saying, you know, we know the pandemic is something that is hovering over all of our heads and affecting every industry, especially uh, our industry in public transit. And we wanted to make sure that we uh, instill confidence with our riders and our train systems because we know at every turn when uh, you leave the house, you have to worry about your glove, you have your mask, are you staying six feet away? We wanted to at least make sure your, 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 uh, your ride to and from wherever your destination was was the last thing that you were worried about. You know, even if you got a mask, your train was going to be clean and disinfected. But we understand that there are many reasons why people would or would not be riding the train. And we just want to let them know that whenever you decide to ride Metro, the train will be ready and willing and prepared for you. And so we came up with a uh, community with confidence campaign is really under my Metro, which is a belief and a philosophy and an attitude. And it's about taking personal responsibility for you know, what we do at Metro and also what we do for our riders and ourselves and, 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 the, and the workers at Metro. And so our campaign included slogans for out of home. We had a big billboard campaign. There were slogans such as riding together, sitting apart, uh, commute with confidence, dedicated to disinfecting, committed to cleaning, masks are a must, uh, no touching, that's the ticket, uh, putting safety first and serious about sanitizing. Because again, we wanted people to see these signs and go, you know, if I do have to ride public transit and there's, there's traffic on the expressway is getting a lot busier, I might consider going on a train. Metro's taking care of it already and I can get on there and ride with confidence. That was our main goal. So work with Out of Home, also do some digital advertising and some local television advertising on WGN and some radio advertising across various radio networks. Because we want to make sure that, you know, we know Metro is in, in the Chicago and North Eastern Illinois area is a, is a top choice for public transit. We want to remind people that we are, and also again, reminding that we are doing everything we can to make sure they stay safe, uh, as we all are trying to stay safe, uh, going to and from work and staying at home ourselves. So that's just a small snippet about our campaign and things we're doing here at Metro. Thanks, Robert. And uh, what we are trying to focus on is that it is safe to ride, uh, as Bill was pointing out, he was frustrated by some, with some of the things that have been said, but it is safe to ride. We do have uh, uh, social distancing within the cars because we're running full length trains all day long. And that we, as a result of this program, as a result of reassuring people, we have seen a modest increase. But the real issue is going to be coming to are people going to return to work downtown in their offices, even if it's just a day or two. So with that, uh, I think that unless you have uh, some other questions that uh, perhaps I could answer or Robert could answer, uh, maybe we can wrap this up. And hopefully we all of you have viewed this as successful. And if you do, uh, please let um, uh, Brett know. And we are looking forward to scheduling a, another topic here shortly that I think would be of interest to a lot of people and particularly those with an engineering bent. Brett? Yeah, um, we will, we have another, uh, we're planning in our next uh, Sandhouse uh, for November. So information will be going out on that relatively soon. 
Um, but uh, we had really fantastic attendance today, and I see that a good portion of people have stayed on through uh, most of the you know the Q and A. So uh, this isn't our first Zoom session like this, and I think um, hopefully this has been enjoyable to everyone. And uh, we look forward to the next one, which is will also be by this format in November. And that's all I have, Norm. So Norm, thank you for helping us kick off the uh, 2021 academic year. Thank you, and we'll see all of you, we hope, in November, or hear from you at least. Thank you again. And thank you, Joan. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Bye. Take care.